Russia. In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Good afternoon, evening or morning, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the third edition of Emerging Stories, Journalism in uh, Isolation. Uh, I'm your host, Kadir van Looijs, and every week I will have different guests, either photographers, filmmakers, writers, or uh, journalists. Um, you can join us uh, uh, via Pakas de Zwijger. You go to dezwijger.nl, or via Zoom, you can chat with uh, other viewers, or with a Q&A, you can speak to my guests. Uh, very happy to... Uh, let you know what my guests are today. Uh, first of all, live in the studio, just back from Iran, we have uh, Thomas Erdbrink, uh, Bureau Chief of the New York Times. We will talk a bit about this. Uh, then via Zoom, we have uh, Maxime Aristavi. He's a producer for Free Press Eastern Europe and a very good journalist. Welcome to you as well. And last but not least, Marion van Rooyen, who is a correspondent in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Welcome to you all. Um, Thomas, very happy to have you here. Um, I believe you arrived quite recently from Iran, right? Well, thanks for having me, Kadir, and thank you, Pakhuis Weiger, for having me here. Um, yes, I arrived uh, last week Sunday from Iran. Uh, I was the New York Times bureau chief in Iran for over eight years. Um, I worked for Dutch media before that, and um, I uh, unfortunately, during the la my last year in Iran, uh, my press credentials uh, were uh, taken fr uh, from me, were revoked by the Iranian authorities. So I wasn't able to work. And uh, since last week, I took on a new assignment. Um, and now I will be, or I am, the uh, bureau chief for Northern Europe. And Northern Europe uh, is uh, the Netherlands but also all Scandinavian countries. And I just returned from Sweden uh, yesterday. That uh, sounds like a bit of a change from Iran to the Netherlands, Northern Europe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's, I think for, for those who know me and for those who don't know me, I, I, I spent 20 years in Iran, which obviously means that I love the country. I love the people and I really greatly enjoyed um, writing about Iran, uh, but unfortunately, because of circumstances, uh, I was forced uh, to do something new in my life, which brought me back to my uh, home country of, of the Netherlands. And um, naturally, this is a change. For me, uh, to go to Sweden was also a big change. I'd never been to Sweden. And the one thing which was very interesting that at this moment is Sweden and Iran are sort of united when it comes to fighting the corona crisis. But, but let me go, yeah. go first to Iran, because, um, you, you know, you, you haven't worked for more than a year. So Correct, yeah. you were maybe the first one who was kind of in quarantine in that sense. Exactly. Um, yeah, so um, the coronavirus struck Iran uh, pretty quickly after China, and this this meant that uh, we were already in quarantine in uh, in uh, if I'm not mistaken, sort of mid mid February, uh, third week of Fe February. People started to quarantine themselves because there were a lot of rumors about the coronavirus being present in Iran, and um, also uh, the direction of the authorities wasn't always that clear. Um, so uh, yeah, we we quarantined, and I, I think that uh, you know I'm. I have quarantined a lot more than a lot of other people. I'm also pretty sick and tired of being quarantined. <laughs> but you, you could travel back to the Netherlands, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's true. I, uh, uh, I I flew with Qatar Airways, uh, which is still I'm not want to promote Qatar Airways here specifically, but they're still flying around the world. And um, yeah, I flew in a Airbus 350 with uh, 10 people on board, so it's a private jet. Nice. Um, so. I mean, we we hear now and then we hear the stories about Iran. I think uh, last week or two weeks ago, it was announced that uh, that the shops and the bazaars reopened. 
people are always a bit suspicious about uh, the numbers which are coming out of Iran or, or Russia. What, what would you say about this? Well, I think it's definitely clear that since Iran was struck quite early in the whole corona crisis period, um, the authorities in the beginning were overwhelmed and uh, like, uh, I must say, actually several other countries, they didn't take it as serious as they should have from the start. And um, obviously there was a lot of focus on Iran because it was the second uh, epicenter of the pandemic uh, after China. And uh, we, heard of, we, we heard, of course, the stories of uh, Iranian politicians also uh, being infected with, with the coronavirus. And all in all, this, this picture was created of Iran as, as a country that couldn't control what was happening to them. Now, I do want to give them some leeway because later all these things also happened in our societies. Uh, Boris Johnson also got coronavirus, although he thought he wouldn't get it. And uh, there are numerous examples of uh, politicians in the Western world who uh, have gotten corona. Uh, the same thing goes for counting the numbers. Uh, uh, Iran has definitely uh, tried to be transparent with the numbers, but there are a lot of suspicions that the numbers are higher, just like, for instance, in China, just like in other countries. Uh, but what we're also seeing is that uh, a lot of countries have different ways of counting. Uh, and uh, uh, not everybody is transparent. For instance, you could say that the Belgians are counting in a much more honest way uh, than other countries, and therefore the numbers are also up. Uh, and the Iranians have opened up by now. Uh, they say their numbers are going down. Um, I must say that when I was there last, let's say, uh, eight, nine days ago, uh, we were not noticing in our direct environment uh, a new spike in numbers. And we haven't seen actually a second wave anywhere in the world yet. So let's hope the Iranians and everybody else is spared from this. And, and your, your family and friends in, in Iran? They they have been okay so far? Uh, we've had uh, one distant uncle of my wife. My wife is Iranian, uh, who, who passed away uh, because of coronavirus. We have had several family members who have had coronavirus, um, but uh, fortunately they, they, they all recovered. Um, and, uh, well, people there go out with masks, what you see in many countries, except for uh, the Netherlands and, and Sweden, for instance. Uh, and people uh, sometimes wear latex gloves, there's a lot of hand washing and there's a lot of, yeah, what people like to call social distancing. I prefer physical distancing more because social distancing is a terrible term. Because, yeah. because there, there, was, there was unrest in Iran as well. Did, what happened there? Did that, the virus killed it? Um, well, there's been unrest in Iran basically uh, for, yeah, basically since President Trump pulled out of the nuclear agreement uh, in was it again, I think 2017. Um, and uh, therefore upending the, the agreement that Iran had made with Europe, with China, with Russia, um, you know, with uh, controlled by the UN and the International Atomic Energy Agency. After that, the Americans reimposed their sanctions, which of course was a big blow to the Iranian economy. Um, and the Iranian economy was already in trouble because of mismanagement and widespread corruption by the Iranian leaders. Um, so this created uh, yeah, a perfect storm, if you will, uh, uh, and put people a lot under pressure. There were protests in, 2000, in, in 2019, in November, uh, in which between 200 to 1,500 people died. Very difficult to get a clear picture of this. Um, and it definitely shows that Iran and Iranians are under a lot of pressure. And still are. And still are, yeah. So, <laughs> you, you came back to the Netherlands. Are you going to live here, actually? Um, I will be based in Amsterdam, which is kind of nice, because then I get to see uh, Kadir van Lohuizen every now and then. Um, but uh, uh, I'm not sure yet if I will actually live here most of the time, since I also cover uh, uh, the Scandinavian countries. I could also imagine to live in Stockholm for a while, or in Copenhagen, or any of these places. So I just want to re discover the region where I'm going to work. So, so you... you, you you just came back from Sweden. I mean, I think we, we know that Sweden is kind of uh, the outsider from Europe, that, that they didn't impose such a rigid reg regulations or restrictions as they did elsewhere. What, uh, well, I think you have a small film about it, right? Maybe we can have a look at it. So 
So that's not what we would call social distancing, right? No. This is actually a park um, in um, in um, in a neighborhood in Sweden. And um, when I arrived there on Thursday, um, yeah, you could see that the Swedes have a distinctively different approach uh, to the coronavirus than many other countries. Why? Because it didn't go into lockdown. And um, so these are ca cafes, bars. These are cafes and bars that are open. And as you can see, people are not uh, keeping big distance from each other. And what is very interesting is that the, the Swedes often compare themselves to the Nordic countries. But of course, they have smaller populations and they all went into lockdown. But if you compare Sweden to countries more of its own size, uh, you can see that the death toll is not proportionally higher uh, than, uh, than, uh, than in other countries. So either the Swedes did something very right um, or they did something very wrong. Of course, we are in the middle of this uh, corona uh, pandemic and we still have to see the final end results about how many people who died but I think but if you compare yeah. it to to like uh, Norway and Denmark it's, it seems to be higher no or yeah Norway and Denmark also have much smaller populations so uh, and they went they went into 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 lockdown I think what the Swedes take into to account which is very important is that uh, that the society uh, th there's there's many people who have a stake in society and uh, the Swedes are also thinking about children who have a safe space in school, for instance, or they're thinking about uh, younger people uh, who would get a lot of stress from uh, from being in a lockdown for several weeks. And what you tend to see, for instance, in the Netherlands, where I'm now based, is that people mainly think about the virus and the economy. And uh, I think as societies, we should be more than that. Uh, than just thinking about the economy and the virus. And I think mental health is, is very important. We are the last free societies uh, in that sense. Uh, we are a kind of a special island in the world uh, with, uh, with, with, with health care, um, uh, high uh, taxes and other things. And we should, we should think about these issues as well. So, because it, to me it seems like in the, in the beginning the Netherlands was very reluctant to impose strict restrictions to close down the schools businesses then it finally happened and now we seem to be really slow in lifting them how, well, how, how I, do you look at this compared to well it, it was very surprising because I, I was in the Netherlands in the period before uh, before the lockdown and and I was I came from Iran and I had self quarantined and I was warning my friends that uh, the coronavirus is something serious and we have to be uh, very careful and people should start distancing but in in Holland people are still hugging and kissing and uh, God knows you know do, doing what and now you, uh, then I came back last week and I noticed that the, not only has the mood completely shifted, but also um, the Dutch Calvinist streak has taken over by basically embracing the rules up to a point that it almost becomes a caricature of itself. Because everywhere you go in town, you can see people waiting in line with, with, with one and a half meter distance. And this has become some holy mantra of, of keeping distance. And if you look at the development of the virus, then the people who should mainly take very good care are people above 70 and not, and not everybody. And... Of course, it's important to stop the spread of the virus, but it's also important to constantly think, are we following the right approach or not? And I think for Holland now, this is the moment to re reconsider that policy. And, and our, well, I, I want to bring in Marion and Maxime as well. I mean, uh, the, all very good journalists. What, it, it is, uh, is our journalists, um, are they critical enough? about how, how we are all reporting about the situation and how we are following government uh, leads? Well, if I, well, if, 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 if uh, yeah, please, Marion, go ahead. Well, if you have to follow the Brazilian government lead, it's, uh, it's not nothing more than a little cold. Today was the 5,000th death, dead. And uh, the president uh, of Brazil said, so what, everybody has to die at a certain moment. I mean, uh, he thinks that uh, social distancing, uh, being in, in lockdown is total craziness and, uh, and it will hurt him and, uh, and his government. But, so, uh, but uh, is the Brazilian press, are, are they critical enough about this? Well, the, the, the non-Bolsonaro part is very, very critical, mm. of course, because uh, they, they, they said all the time, uh, this health system will go into collapse, and now it's collapsing. Uh, doctors have to choose who to who, who can live and who has to die. Uh, there are uh, now uh, meat containers in front of the of the hospitals because the dead and the and the living are are in the same room. It's it's, it's a total collapse. Now. We're going to talk about this in a minute. 
Um, um, but, but you were saying something well, about the Dutch press. Or well, what is very interesting for me is that we always tend to look at countries that, 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 that we in the West call less developed countries and look at the media situation over there. But I do think also that, uh, that, that uh, large segments of the Dutch media were throughout the crisis completely in line uh, with with what the government was saying. And although, you know, you can say that that is a good thing, I, I always like to be served a whole set of different opinions in order to try and make my own opinions. And I think that is something that we pride each other for, for in the media. And recently, um, a famous Dutch uh, current affairs show, News Uur, News Hour, uh, uh, did, did uh, an item criticizing uh, the team of Dutch scientists um, that are basically making our policy right now, who, 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 who are, bas are basically more influential than the politicians and you could see that uh, that this show got a lot of criticism uh, from not only the general public but also from some of the scientists involved in this group for even raising uh, raising uh, uh, criticism or uh, you know alternative thinking um, regarding the decision-making process in the coronavirus uh, crisis. And I felt that it was very telling that, uh, that, uh, that uh, it's a global thing, that worldwide media is shocked and uh, finds, it, finds it hard to criticize the policies of their own governments. Maxim, how is that? I think the response is always like on a spectrum. And uh, this would be the only obvious thing about this crisis and the COVID crisis that it actually it didn't create any kind of new crises uh, uh, on our hands. So, for example, if you do have incompetent government in charge, um, that uh, it will just expose that incompetence even more. And if you have a country that suffers from lack of uh, independent journalism or its uh, independent journalism is suppressed, like, for example, countries we work with uh, in Azerbaijan, Russia, or Belarus, it's hard for them to get their story out. Um, the, the only uh, trend um, that is basically equal among all the countries, not only in Eastern Europe, but probably now in some countries in uh, in the EU inside as well, is that uh, those governments that had autocratic tendencies before, they now uh, abuse the situation. So, for example, in Russia and Azerbaijan, they went from first complete denial of the epidemic and the impact of the epidemic, so it doesn't expose their incompetency. But when the, po when the point already is that there are so many infected people and you cannot possibly hide this, then they started abusing the situation and cracking down on dissenting voices and uh, tightening their grip of the country in the name of fighting the disease. So I think those tendencies are unfortunately quite universal, whether you talk about free societies or um, autocratic ones or poor or rich ones. Because uh, you, you yourself are uh, Ukrainian, right? You are... Um uh, I believe your parents live live in eastern Ukraine in in the in the Donbas. Yeah, well, uh, it, it is uh, it is concerning because you know on top of that, uh, all the borders are closed, and I'm based in Prague. Uh, um, in the it's imp impossible to travel uh, to 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 see your family or even. In, in line of our work, it's impossible to get connected physically with uh, people we work with. And we, uh, as a network by the journalists, for the journalists, we send people to work in the field as well. And you're always concerned about their safety. But it, do it is double true for countries that have incompetent government, have lack of resources to find the disease. Like, for example, I mean, I worry about my parents. If something happens, whether they're going to be competent uh, officials in the health healthcare system to help them all. Uh, the same goes to my colleagues. Uh, uh, if they do a line of work, get infected, um, I, I have absolutely no assurance that they will be properly treated or even diagnosed properly, as the case with many occupied territories in our region. But your, so far, your parents are they're fine for the moment. Yes, I'm lucky. I want to. Uh, I mean, I check on them every day, and I think in times of crisis like this, one thing is sure for everyone: we start value our personal connections to our loved ones and family more. So you get in touch more often. You uh, value that connection, especially when you're not able to see those people in real life. 
But I worry because they tell the stories uh, how, uh, you know, the, the government is not really uh, very tight on enforcing quarantine. And there is a lack of uh, campaign explaining people what this quarantine means and what the disease does to uh, you and why it's important to keep social distancing, for example. And partially, it's also responsibility of the media as well. I mean, we struggle to get reporters. I mean, we all uh, work with brilliant reporters, but we struggle to get reporters who have any basic knowledge in science, notwithstanding uh, about epidemiology or virusology and other uh, uh, science, uh, science uh, that helps us to understand this, uh, uh, this pandemic. First, back to to yourself because you are uh, you are based in Prague right now, right? And I believe uh, Czech Republic was quite strict uh, when they imposed uh, all the laws about the coronavirus. It, what's the situation now? It's it's being relaxed a bit. Uh, the, the Czech Republic was actually the first among the first one to do the most drastic measures, closing down the borders completely, stopping all the traffic. I mean, this is one of the few countries that do not uh, haven't been allowing even to leave uh, the citizens to leave the country. Now it's a bit easing up because the situation is better. And uh, the local government uh, actually reports uh, a better than a better than average situation compared to other EU countries because of those drastic measures. But you know, the the most um, uh, interesting part about it is not because the government was, uh, you know, exclusively competent or knew better how to handle the pandemic. I think it's part of the uh, uh, historic and cultural legacy in this whole region of Central Eastern Europe, where people actually who lived through a lot of cataclysmic events and at the beginning, they knew for sure that they won't not have any additional luxury resources to fight this virus uh, because of crippling healthcare or just because of lack of resources or poverty. That's why, you know, they all went through dr uh, after drastic uh, measures so early uh, in early March. And I think that in case, for example, of Czech Republic, it worked pretty well. And I see that, for example, quarantine measures in some countries like Ukraine or Georgia are much more severe than in many years European Union countries. And it also helped them to kind of flatten the curve quite early on, despite that they're, you know, much poorer and uh, less prepared to, for, to face such a cataclysmic event. Because you are you are in Prague and you're you're reporting on uh, on on parts of the former Soviet Union like Eastern Ukraine, Nagorno Karabakh, Transnistria, even Crimea. I'm all areas which are kind of declared themselves independent or were independent before or are occupied. We we know very little about this. Is is it possible for you to report about this and and what can you tell us about it? Well, Free Press for Eastern Europe is a you know support network by the journalists for the journalists, and our job is basically make sure that the journalists on the ground get necessary resources and their work is amplified and elevated so their stories get heard and they get to travel better. And of course, within our network, many journalists report from the occupied parts of Eastern Europe. And there are, you know, unfortunately millions of people living in those pockets from really tiny ones like South Ossetia in Georgia or a really large one like Eastern Ukraine and Donbass. Uh, in uh, in in Ukraine, so I find at the moment. I mean, it's been very hard to report from there. Uh, you know, even before that, and many journalists that we work, they need to work anonymously just to get their stories out. But I find now so many you know weird and disturbing bridges because between the way they work on those occupied and uh, unrecognized territories and what other journalists have to face in other countries. For example, the severe movement restrictions. Uh, this is something that many journalists face uh, there as well. When you is you're not able to report properly on the streets. You're not able to talk to people properly because of emergency powers that many governments have, even self-declared governments. 
you cannot get official confirmation of anything or your work is just uh, restricted because you're, you know, you're called not essential person to be on the streets and talk to people. And also, you know, the very massive problem is again, incompetency of those even seven de declared governments. If you're a journalist, just a journalist, a regular human being, and you're on the front lines and you have to go out and you have to talk to people in line of your work because that's what you do. And sometimes you got to talk to it in person because I mean, I love Zoom and uh, video calls, but this, it doesn't establish uh, the necessary trust between you and the person you talk to very often. But if you have incompetent government, you cannot count on the you know just basic safety net that will protect you from getting infected or get uh, getting tested or being treated well. So this is very scary to find those parallels quite uh, adequate, quite strong between what journalists face in uh, in the regular parts of the world and rich part of the world, parts of the world and those um you know absolutely of uh, semi forgotten parts like uh, um the unrecognized territories in eastern europe but but did uh, all all of these uh, regions areas you you're talking about did they all go into a lockdown or did they all saw that there was an issue or was there some yeah. some kind of denial as well so for sure, most of those territories are uh, backed or Russian occupied. So they basically followed the same pattern as they followed in Russia. So Russia went into severe lockdown and shutdown, and many uh, occupied and non-recognized territories also went into that shutdown. And we actually, um, you know, uh, ask our journalists working on the ground to report on the, those shutdowns, and I'd say that they're quite severe and in the most in more authoritarian places they're enforced even uh more severely because again autocratic forces find it very attractive way to whitewash their uh power grabs with uh, anti you know anti-covid quarantine measures but uh the problem is not probably the severity of a shutdown the problem is how do they respond to the uh, epidemic uh, in general like for example tiny south ossetia uh, um, an unrecognized territory of georgia has a population of just 35000 people and they had just one uh, intensive care unit system for the whole region and they had no uh, tests, zero tests, even in the in, on the peak of the epidemic in uh, late March. So you can imagine that you know it's not enough just to shut people uh, in their you know to force people to be shut down in their homes. What do you do if you have absolutely no resources to handle or manage the pandemic? Something that we're now need to uh, face in, um, you know, figure out how to do that. And of course, those territories, again, where millions of people live, um, they're absolutely not prepared to do it efficiently or any adequate way possible. But do we, do, do we have any, any numbers of people being, how many people are being affected or, or died, or is that, there's nothing mm -hmm. really? Well, some of the self-declared governments, like in Transnistria uh, and uh, in uh, Eastern occupied Eastern Ukraine, they do report some numbers. But again, like this, the the case of Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Ukraine is very uh, um, illustrative because uh, they kept reporting numbers that they have some dozens of infected people, then hundreds of infected people with COVID. But again, um, we don't believe those numbers at all because they don't have any testing available to back those numbers up. And before the COVID spread, uh, uh, the, the COVID uh, attack to, uh, occupied Eastern Ukraine, there was also outbreak of uh, deadly swine flu as well. So uh, our journalists on the ground who work with the uh, uh, Russian language news exchange and free press for Eastern Europe, they always report uh, a very large numbers of people who are in the hospitals or unusual death rate, uh, rate, uh, rates among people with pneumonia-like symptoms. But those uh, cases are not being registered as uh, COVID-19 related. This is uh, terrifyingly the same situation that is happening in Russia as well, where they do report a large number of people infected. But again, from testimonies that our journalists bring from the hospitals, from doctors, uh, from works, 
those just numbers do not add up when you compare to uh, regular death rate for this kind of uh, uh, season in those countries. So the truth is definitely different that is being reported by many governments in that region. Hmm. But I think I heard you saying that that like journalists in eastern Ukraine are, are mm -hmm. restricted in their movements uh, sure. because of COVID-19 uh, or it's being used by the by the self-called government there. Is that is that the case in, in other any of the other regions as well where you where your colleagues are working? Well, first of all, uh, the journal has been restricted there for a long time and you know for occupied eastern uh, ukraine it's been the case uh, since the start of the war because you need to get like official registration to work as a journalist and you cannot get one if you are not officially aligned with the uh, position of self-declared governments so uh, sometimes we send our partners from you know neighboring countries or from uh, from uh, government controlled territories to report on the situation there but since the shut since the borders are completely closed, we're not able to send off and, you know, help our partners to send any teams there. Our partners uh, who have reporters on the ground uh, constantly uh, tell that uh, basically there is a, a big problem with just walking around the streets and taking pictures. And for example, if you do work on the ground anonymously, uh, what can you possibly do in terms of photos and pictures? You just, you know, take your phone and you try to sneak a picture or video so nobody kind of, you know, uh, sees that. But if their streets are completely empty, even if you're allowed outside, there is increased uh, control on the streets, both surveillance and then, uh, you know, with, with police. So it's, it's getting harder even to take trivial pictures of what is happening on the ground. So yes, this is, um, this is very hard period for them to report and to use anything except their own words in, in writing. Because up till not so long ago, uh, we still got reports of the fighting in eastern Ukraine. What, what happens there? Well, there's still, uh, unfortunately, fighting along the contact line, uh, and the people keep uh, uh, being injured or dying, uh, mostly military folks on the, on the both sides. However, our partners report that there is a decreased intensity of those fighting. I mean, we have also kind of simmering con military conflict with uh, regular uh, deaths and injuries uh, in Nagorno Karabakh, which is a disputed territory between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, there is also a decrease of military activity there as well. And a, a lot of people in the region actually uh, speculate that because of the COVID and because of the epidemic and because of a disproportionately bad impact that the pandemic has on unrecognized territories, those military conflicts might be uh, frozen at least for a while because uh, this is just not the time for it. And again, with the Russian military support trying not because Russia is going through its own very severe economic crisis um, multiplied by the oil crisis, we don't think that it's going to uh, get uh, very hot on the front line. However, you know, the, the recent news just from today was regarding Crimea because of the very severe drought that the most of Europe is suffering now. Um, the situation in Crimea is deteriorating quickly because they have deficit of water, uh, drinking water. And, uh, you know, on the Ukrainian side, they warned that Russia might uh, ramp up the military activity to try to uh, steal and occupy lands with the more uh, uh, water uh, uh, channels, uh, water canals in on the Ukrainian uh, side. But, you know, those are just hiking fears among this general pandemic fear. So we will just uh, wait and see if uh, one or another will turn out to be true. Thomas uh, Marion, maybe any other questions for Maxime? I think uh, let's leave Marion. Uh I, I, well, yes, go ahead. A, yeah, in a way, it's it's similar here. Uh, with with talking about the numbers and and uh, because now the number is officially five thousand corona dead, but um, 
Brazil tests tw 12 times fewer than Iran, for example. They don't, just don't test. And people go, uh, go to their graves with things like insufficient respiration. And that the, the people uh, in certain parts of, of Brazil that go to their graves with in, in, in such insufficient respiration is like a, a, a thousand percent more than in the same period last year. So to, to get the real picture, it's, quite, it's, it's nearly impossible. Hmm. And talking to people in the hospital, there are, I, I have talked to, to people who, who have family working in the hospitals and they say uh, the dead are, are getting out of the back door because, it is, it, because this government wants corona just to be a stupid flu. So it, you are. Just, it, I see the same uh, that you see. Like according to the regime you have, and according to what this regime wants to be true or not true, they are manipulating uh, the, the, the figures, I, or I, manipulating, or or just not the means to, to to have a good picture of the situation. For sure. I mean, if uh, we have so many, so much disinformation also flying around. I think it's true, equally true for Brazil, like for Eastern Europe as well. And a lot of people in times of such, you know, heightened fear, they believe in many conspiracy theories as well, much more eagerly. So, but, you know, again, talking with people on the ground, even talking with my parents, and they talk to their friends who work in the hospitals, sometimes it's not the question of just malign intent to hide the truth. Because if you have a weak healthcare system and doctors are not prepared to file statistics properly, they just don't know what to do uh, with it. Like, for example, if a person died from complications, pneumonia or heart failure or so on, so on, they just register uh, the way they see it fit. And sometimes it's just not uh, in the result uh, in indicates or illustrates the real situation. But again, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a job for journalists to look deeper and trying to figure out numbers that make sense of actual situation, not just this, you know, uh, count that we do every day so much and so many people got infected. This doesn't say, uh, unfortunately, much for us or for our audiences. Yeah. Because, Ma Maxime, uh, I, I had one more question before we move to Marion, because I believe you, you, you're doing a lot for the queer community in Eastern Europe as well. Um, to, to, to what extent is this whole uh, COVID-19 affecting the, that community, specifically in mm. Eastern Europe? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, as a queer journalist myself, that's uh, something that I always pay extra attention. And of course, you can hear a lot of things right now that, you know, the, the, the question of minorities is not the question of priority now because we got to fight this uh, huge pandemic and this is just uh, nonsensical for us to pay attention to many human rights violations. However, having experience with Eastern Europe and Eastern Europe probably hosts one of the most horrible places for queer people to live in from Russia to Azerbaijan. You know, you see a clear pattern with the way pandemic spreads in the communities it, it affects. And now it's quite clear that communities that are in many countries are the most uh, oppressed in terms of uh, human rights. There are also communities that suffer from poverty disproportionately. And that's the case for a queer community in Eastern Europe. So a pandemic targets those communities disproportionately bad. And uh, you, if we talk right now a lot about uh, possible second, third wave that is coming, and we can see at the examples of countries like Singapore, where the second wave is uh, uh, emerging from the community of labor migrants that live in extreme poverty, you can bet that those communities that are oppressed the most and suffer from poverty disproportionately, including queer community, they're gonna be actually uh, the one that is going to be the source of uh, second, third, whatever wave. So I think reporting on those communities becomes much more important, not because we need to, you know, because we have this right to uh, speak out about human rights violations, but because it's a, a security issue within the fighting the pandemic as well. 
Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, I, I feel like many people now overlook or do not take the magnitude of uh, what it means in terms of the, uh, the spread of pandemic. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you for talking to us. And um, please stay on the show, and, uh, but stay, uh, stay healthy. Um, My pleasure. Marion, we go to, to you, Marion in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Um, you've been living there uh, quite a long time. Uh, your president, or the president of Brazil, has been in line with uh, Donald Trump and uh, Boris Johnson in, uh, in denying initially uh, the, the COVID-19 virus, uh, saying it was just a flu. Where's uh, Bolsonaro nowadays, and uh, what, what's the situation? Well, I, I, I already said, uh, to, he said, he says, so what? Everybody has to die. I, uh, my, my name is uh, uh, Bolsonaro, and I have to die too. So what can I do? Take it as a man, he says. Take it as a man. Uh, when it rains, you get wet. So we, I mean, uh, Trump and Boris Johnson, they, they kind of changed. He, he didn't? No, no, he, he didn't. Uh, he actually fired his, uh, uh, his, minister, his minister of, uh, of health care uh, because the minister of health care wants a lockdown, wants uh, more testing, wants all that. And, and Bolsonaro just doesn't get it. He doesn't want it. He, he is totally out of control in that. Uh, last week, he fired another uh, minister. He fires them all the time. He's uh, concentrating power, and he's concentrating it uh, amongst his followers, the 30 percent. But he's, got, he's getting the vote of the poor now also, because the poor, uh, most of them, they, they have uh, um, not regist registered jobs. So uh, they cannot go out, and, and Bolsonaro goes out all the time uh, hugging and, and shaking hands and coughing in the face of everybody to show that uh, if you believe in Bolsonaro, then you, then, you don't get COVID, of, of course. Oh, that is he and his sons. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, it, he's, it, are, are you actually, it, are you saying that yeah. he's winning in popularity? He's not losing. Everybody was thinking he would lose, but he is, he is getting the poor. Because how, how do you go how do you go in quarantine when you live in a, in a favela with 10, 10 people in a house? It's impossible. Tiny small houses. People have to go go out to, to, do, to do their their daily daily bread. And Bolsonaro is counting on it, and he is getting away with it because he already did in Corona times two times. He organized um, he and his sons organized uh, big demonstrations. Uh, to ask for uh, the installation of, of a military dictatorship with, with Bolsonaro at, uh, on the head. Uh, they want to, 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 they ask to cancel all civil rights. They want to put people in jail without due process. They w want the right to torture now. That's what those people ask for. And uh, Bolsonaro goes and speaks to that. They want, they want also a parliament to be closed. And um, yeah. 40% uh, is okay with it. Really? And before, yeah, it's it's very, very scary what's going so, on here at this moment. They are, this is a way Corona is used, a, a different way than in other countries where they, they use the lockdown to, to, to reinforce control. Here, this, this clan of Bolsonaro and his three sons who have, who, who have the cabinet of hate, is, is it, it is called, they have... Uh, a very powerful um, grip on social media. Here, here they are, the, the three sons, the, uh, the cabinet of hate. They, they control all the virtual media and they have virtual death squads. That they, they attack, for example, one journalist who, who, who reports, uh, who does good, good reporting, especially women are attacked by them. And, and, and it's really called a death squad or a militia because they put the address of the of the journalist on the internet. They, but my uh, own, they, they put, yeah. Okay. What what are the numbers in in Brazil, or are, are there any numbers which we which we can trust? Numbers of what? Of the of the virus, you know. I mean, the, the government no. is denying, but people no, are dying, are no, no. 
What, what are we seeing? Are... What's this picture we're seeing here? I don't see a picture. Oh yeah, yeah, mass graves, mass graves. So because, uh, yeah. So there are no no there are no real numbers. Yes, there are real numbers of uh, there are now five thousand official dead uh, who have uh, uh, corona tested. But as I, I as I told you, there there is uh, um, in the United States they test thirty two times more. They don't test the dead in many hospitals. There is not even they cannot fill out a corona or COVID-19 as a, a reason of death because it's not in their, in their hospital system. Mm. So yeah, the numbers are much, much, much higher than, than for real. the University of Sao Paulo now calculated that the dead must be 16 times higher. The official, so the official dead is 5,000, but it must be 16 times more. People die also in the houses now, especially in the favela. Um, that's creating a problem now because uh, the, the uh, ambulances don't go to the favela and ambulances cannot take dead bodies. But there, people have no money to ask for a, a fu funeral uh, parlor to, to take the dead away. So, so now, why, why do ambulances not go to the favela? No. Why not? They may not. Because uh, it's dangerous, they say. Okay. Yesterday, I believe there was a report that uh, Bolsonaro might be investigated. What, yes. Can you bring us up to that story? Uh, yes, that has to do with the minister of um, the, the minister of justice uh, just uh, uh, quit mm -hmm. because Bolsonaro. Uh, took away the, minute, the, 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 the director of the federal police. And the federal police is doing investigations on the three sons and, and on, the, uh, on the fake news they are spreading and on the, on the virtual death squad, squads they are managing. And uh, Bolsonaro w wanted all, the, all the, se the secret reports and wanted to know all the investigations. So everything that was going on, but the... Uh, the, the head of the federal police at that at that time, la, until next uh, until last week, didn't want to give those reports. And now he puts he put a, a friend of his sons there. He has put a friend of his sons there, and of course he is he's going to give uh, all the all the all the reports. But the uh, the high uh, how do you call it high court now is investigating uh, is investigating uh, Bolsonaro. So should but, he, is he worried? Yes. No, because it, his followers asked to shut down the high court as they, as they want to shut down the parliament. So, uh, Mayon, you, you are an independent journalist. You've been living for a long time in, in Rio. The, the, you know, I mean, uh, it, is your work of affected, well, first of all, by this yeah. government? <laughs> I can't go out, yeah. you're, you're, you cannot go out. No, because the governor, the governors, uh, they have their own politics. They they do shutdowns. Rio has officially a, sh a shutdown. And that includes people, journalists. Yeah. No. But can you? Uh, is is it different for you? Uh, let's speak before uh, before COVID nineteen entered Brazil. Is it difficult, different for you to work in in Brazil under the government of Bolsonaro, or can you still? Yeah, the difference has nothing to do with COVID. The difference has to do with Bolsonaro. I mean, you you, you get a lot of hostility, um, especially. Well, for, for me, it's not so 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 bad because I'm I'm just a, a Dutch journalist, but for Brazilian journalists, it's it's hell to work. I told you the, the death squads are, are on to you. Uh, so on all the social media, uh, they, they, tell, they <clears throat> tell on the social media where your kids go to school. Those kind of, of things, you, you must be very strong uh, to, to go on reporting in this situation. Well, well because it's, it's, so, it's not the, 
official government that goes after you, but it's it's the um, it's the virtual militias that go after you, and that's very scary. Because I think uh, I've I've been to your place, and I believe you you've been robbed recently at home. You live very close to one of the main favelas in Rio. Yes. Is this connect? You know, are people more desperate? What is this connected yes. to each other? How do you feel? How do yes. you? Yes. <laughs> this is Bolsonaro again denying uh, denying that uh, that COVID does something, and he's pointing to the journalists there <laughs> and saying, "Hey, what are you doing outside? I, am I wrong? I'm I'm outside. I always said you have to be outside. If you are outside, you stupid journalist, I don't talk to you." <laughs> this is incredible, this man. Anyway, yeah, I was robbed. Um, although the uh, the drug traffickers said they they didn't want any robbing going on, so they robbed me anyway. And so it was very hard for me not to, uh, not to get the word out to the drug traffickers because if not, my robbers would have been killed, and that's not some a situation I want. So you, can you see how desperate it is? People have, have just no means. They, they don't know what to do. And I was, I mean, I was robbed by three men with, <clears> with, with weapons, you know, and I was taken hostage for a long time. Um, so, yeah, I said, this is the desperate situation you are in. But you're okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, a, li a little lack of breath sometimes. <laughs> But but what's the situation? Because what, what is the situation in the favelas? I mean, the favelas are the poor neighborhoods of the of the large cities in in Brazil. You know, we talk a lot about social distancing. Uh, look uh, how yeah. how far Thomas and I are apart from each other. Not possible. <laughs> so, yeah, and then and then you have the open sewage systems. So it's not only. Uh, COVID, it's also Zika, it's it's all those illnesses. I mean, uh, in, in Brazil, only 50% of the population has, has a sewage system. Can you imagine what, what that does? And now they say it's also, it, it comes, it may become, can come through, uh, through uh, also the, the, the sewage system. So yeah, it's it's impossible to, to social distance. It's impossible to have health health situation. Uh, most favelas have no good water, water. They are not onto the water system. So people also carry their buckets of water. How can you wash your hands all the time? There is no money for soap. So people are hungry. It's starting to be hungry now. And the, all this all this works in favor of Bolsonaro. Because he wants the chaos. He wants the chaos. He wants the fear. And that's what he's working on. And you see it's working because people are go, go ever more behind him, the poor people. So how, how does it work? Like, like uh, there's a lot of still a good number of wealthy Brazilians. They have uh, Brazilians working for them in the households or in gardens or uh, <laughs> from the favelas. No. No, 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 they don't work anymore. And so all the, all the VIPs are on television all the time to show their poor hands. Look at so, so, so bad from washing my dishes. And, uh, and, 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 for, and people say, and for the first time I cook, look this, I did, I did it myself because people, women, even women don't cook in Brazil, the rich ones. And so they are so proud of, of, of themselves. And they make this beautiful uh, mask, uh, they, they embroider them. And those, yeah, th this is the situation of the rich. It's really, it's really horrible. And the first corona dead in Brazil was a woman uh, who gave, uh, a woman who worked for a lady who, who was at the Ven Venetian carnival, had COVID and she knew it and she didn't tell her, her worker. And that was the first corona dead in Brazil. And that, and also that, the fact that it started with the rich, uh, because the first who were infected was the, the Bolsonaro crowd who had flown uh, to, uh, to have a dinner with Trump. So 20, uh, 32 people of, of his uh, following uh, took, took the corona uh, with, with Trump. 
So they, they, they were the first, and nobody died of that. And, and we are quite sure that even Bolsonaro got it. That's why he is so sure you don't die of it. And um, and now and now it's it, and now it's spreading where you cannot contain it, not at all. I mean, the poor areas, there is no way of containing it. And and those are the ones who die, who die because the rich go to private hospitals. And there are there is still plenty of room in the private hospitals, but it's the poor hospitals now where the dead and the living lay ne one next to the, to the other. There was one. There, I was wondering because there, there's a lot of talk about that the coronavirus might not work or l l like doesn't transmit or grow very fast in in warmer climates. I mean, Brazil is almost like a continent, right? So, what in the tropical parts of Brazil is it different? It's the same. It's the same. It, it apparently it's the same. Okay, it's the the, out, the big outbreak started in, uh, in 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 São Paulo. But now the the, the the collapse the collapse of the uh, the first collapse of the of, of the healthcare system was in Manaus, which is the capital of Amazonas. Hmm. Warmer, you can't you can't be warmer than that. <laughs> uh, Maxime Thomas. Well, I I just find it very interesting that what both Maxime says. Um, um, is that that this coronavirus is actually extrapolating the differences, you know, between social classes, and that's the same what we're getting from Brazil, uh, and it's the same uh, in Iran, and it's even the same I think in the West that poorer people are just hit proportionally higher uh, than uh, uh, than than the rich, and uh, that's something that we should all be reporting on, and at the same time we can't because we all have to stay at home. And it's hard to get in touch with the people you want to report on. So, uh, all in all, I find this a very distressing time for journalism. I, uh, I, if I mean, I, uh, I listen to it, and it's uh, it's it's really remarkable. It's scary, but it's also something that runs very true to where we are. And in terms of in terms of uh, social distance, uh, social classes. This is very true for people who cannot afford social distancing, but also there is another layer to this problem that uh, among the poorest folks in those countries, and this is, as I understand, also the case for Brazil, the poorest folks in the countries do not usually trust the mainstream media in general, and they uh, uh, usually do not like to talk to media, especially that the media is, are vilified by their leaders. So it's really, uh, it becomes really um, hard to report on those communities that are affected the most but not only because they're uh, poor and they cannot do social distancing or they cannot afford um, all those quarantine measures, but also because they do not tend not tend to trust less uh, to journalism and uh, mainstream media in general or any kind of media uh, for that matter. Um. Unfortunately, our time is up, uh, ladies and gentlemen, but I uh, really would like to thank you for uh, for being present. And uh, I think your insights from different parts of the world have been really uh, great for us to hear. Um, well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for watching. Uh, next week, same time, same place. Uh, from Amsterdam, from Pakhuis de Zwijger, we will have another Emerging Stories at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, with another set of great guests uh, in the in the studio, I will have uh, Vladimir van Willigenburg, and he specialized on Syria and Kurdistan, and he will talk, take us and talk about the situation over there, what's going on. Uh, then uh, we will have uh, Shaidul Alam, who's a very well-known uh, author, photographer, writer from Bangladesh uh, who's been in, in prison for quite a long time, detained by the, by the government for, for criticizing them. And he will be speaking about uh, the situation there. And then we will have a writer from Romania who is Roma. And uh, she will talk about the situation of the Roma and the Sinti in uh, Eastern Europe. So thank you very much again for being here and uh, see you next week. Thank you.